Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bobemi. And I'm dead inside. And welcome back to another episode of Brasinger. Ooh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm very excited for today's chapter because it's a very cool chapter, a good chapter. Demi, give us that recap before we dive in to this book. I thought you were going to say before we die. Before we die. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. And go. So Aragon had a bunch of questions for Ormus, and Ormus said, wow, you have a lot of questions. And so then Aragon asked all of his questions. Ormus said, what else could you possibly want? And Aragon said, teach me how to summon spirits. And he said, pick another one. And he said, teach me how to uh, zap things places. And he said, okay. And then Aragon needs a weapon. So then he went to the Manoa tree and Fira pissed her off and caught her on fire or whatever. And then they went bing, bong, bong. And then they found the the meteorites. Damn, you barely just wrapped that up. He also missed that he asked for his true name and Ormus said, no, you need oh, yeah. to find out your true name yourself. I forgot about that. I guess I didn't care that much about it. <laughs> Good recap. Thanks. Damn, I felt like we just read that yesterday or something. Wow. This is going to be fun for everybody watching you and me over the like, next 14 episodes because it's like the 14 episodes that we're in quarantine. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's going to slowly watch us like go insane. <laughs> just fall into madness. I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see what day 14 looks like. Ooh. Chapter 51, Mind Over Metal. Ooh, is he going to zippity-zap it, Aragon? What do you mean? Is he going to, like... Forge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you find that, demanded Runon, as Aragon staggered into the atrium of her house and dropped the lump of bright steel ore under the ground by her feet. In as few words as possible, Aragon explained about Solemn Bum, Sad Butt, and the Manoa Tree. Squatting next to the oar, Runon caressed the pitted surface, her fingers lingering over the metallic patches interspersed among the stone. You were either very foolish or very brave to test the Manoa Tree as you did. She is not one to trifle with. Is there enough ore for a sword? Safira asked. Several swords, if past experience is anything to judge by, said Runon. Rising to her full height, the elf woman glanced at her forge in the center of the atrium, then clapped her hands together, her eyes lighting up with a combination of eagerness and determination. Let us to it, then. You need a sword, Shade Slayer. Very well. I shall give you a sword the likes of which has never been seen before in Allegasia. But what of your oath? Aragon asked. Think not of it for the time being. When must the two of you return to the Varden? We should have left the day we arrived, said Aragon. Runon paused, her expression introspective. Then I shall have to hurry that which I do not normally hurry and use magic to craft that which would otherwise require weeks of work by hand. You and Bright Scales will help me. It was not a question, but Aragon nodded in agreement. We shall not rest tonight, but I promise you, Shade Slayer, you shall have your sword by tomorrow morning. Help. Okay, so if you break an oath in the ancient language, don't you just fucking die? I don't know if you can actually, like, break an oath. I think your oath forbids you from doing things. Remember when, like, Murtag was, like, struggling with something and, like, ni like mm -hmm. not in his forehead, his vein? Because I think he was trying to, like, struggle to break an oath that Galbatorix binded him to. So he was, like, working away around it or something. So I don't think you can actually physically break your oath once it's made. Oh, okay. I don't think you can be like, I'm not going to drink beer in the ancient language, and then you sip a beer and die. I think you'd be like, <laughs> you know, unable okay. to drink it. Disregard. Disregarding. Bending at the knees, Runon lifted the oar from the ground without discernible effort and carried it to the bench with her carving in progress. Aragon removed his tunic and shirt so he would not ruin them during the work to come, and in their place Runon gave him a tight-fitting jerkin and a fabric, a fabric apron treated so that it was impervious to fire. 
Runon wore the same. When Aragon asked her about gloves, she laughed, shook her head, or she laughed and shook her head. Only a clumsy smith uses gloves. Then Runon led him to a low, grotto-like chamber set within the trunk of one of the trees out of which her house was grown. Inside the chamber were bags of charcoal and loose piles of whitish clay bricks. By means of a spell, Aragon and Runon lifted several hundred bricks and carried them outside next to the open-walled forge, then did the same with the bags of charcoal, each of which was as large as a man. Once the supplies were arranged to Runon's satisfaction, she and Aragon built a smelter for the ore. The smelter was a complex structure, and Re Runon refused to use magic to construct it, so the project took them the most of the afternoon. First they dug a rectangular pit five feet deep, which they filled with layers of sand, gravel, clay, charcoal, and ash, and in which they embedded a number of chambers and channels to wick away moisture that would otherwise dampen the heat of the smelting fire. Then the contents of the pit were level with the ground, or when the contents of the pit were level with the ground, they assembled a trough of bricks on top of the layers below, using water and unfired clay as their mortar. Ducking inside her house, Runon returned with a pair of bellows, which they attached to holes at the base of the trough. They broke then to drink and to eat a few bites of bread and cheese. After the brief repast, Runon placed a handful of small branches in the trough, lit them on fire with a murmured word, and when the flame... <laughs> And when the flames were well set, laid medium-sized pieces of seasoned oak along the bottom. For nearly an hour, she tended the fire, cultivating it with the care of a gardener growing roses, until the wood had burned down to an even bed of coals. Then, Runon nodded to Aragon and said, Now. Jesus. Like, no warning, nothing. Aragon lifted the lump of ore and gently lowered it into the trough. When the heat on his fingers become unbearable, he released the ore and jumped back as a fountain of sparks swirled upward like a flame of fire, like a swarm of fireflies. On top of the ore and the coals, he shoveled a thick blanket of charcoal as fuel for the fire. Aragon brushed the charcoal dust from his palms, then grasped the handles of one set of bellows and began to pump it. As did Runon, the bellows on the other side of the smelter, or as did Runon, the bellows on the other side of the smelter. Between them, they supplied the fire with a, set, with a steady stream of fresh air so that it burned ever hotter. The scales on Sephira's chest, as well as the underside of her head and neck, sparkled with dazzling flashes of light as the flames in the smelter danced. She crouched several yards away, her eyes fixed upon the molten heart of the fire. I could help you with this, you know, she said. It would take me but a minute to melt the ore. Yes, said Runon, but if we melt it too quickly, the metal will not combine with the charcoal, and become hard and flexible enough for a sword. Save your fire, dragon. We shall need it later. The heat from the smelter and the effort of the pumping... The heat from the smelter and the effort of pumping the bellows soon had Aragon covered in a sheen of sweat. His bare arms shone in the light from the fire. His hard arms. His hard body. Every now and then, he or Runon would abandon their bellows to shovel a new layer of charcoal over the fire. The work was monotonous, and as a result, Aragon soon lost track of time. The constant roar of the fire, the feel of the bellows handle in his hands, the whoosh of rushing air, and Saphira's vigilant presence were the only things he was aware of. It's like, it's not whoosh, it's like whoosh, right? Whoosh? Whooshing? I just feel like I like, you know, definitely overpronounce that. Like, what are you doing in these woos? <laughs> <laughs> the woosh. <laughs> I would say woosh. Woosh. But now that you say that. <laughs> it sounds weird. It doesn't feel right. Maybe I'm just inside my own head too much. <laughs> what are you doing in these woos? Wooshing around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's not right. It came as a surprise to him then when Runon said, that should be sufficient. Leave the bellows. Wiping his brow, Aragon helped as she shoveled the incandescent coals out of the smelter and into a barrel filled with water. The coals sizzled and emitted an acrid smell as they struck the liquid. When they finally exposed the glowing pool... <laughs> when they finally exposed the glowing pool of white-hot metal at the bottom of the trough, the slag and other impurities having run off during the process, 
Rune uncovered the metal with an inch of fine white ash, then leaned her shovel against the side of the smelter and went to sit on the bench by her forge. What now? Aragon asked as he joined her. Now. We wait. For what? Runon gestured towards the sky, where the light from the setting sun painted a tattered array of clouds red and purple and gold. It must be dark when we work the metal if we are to correctly judge its color. Also, the bright, the bright steel needs time to cool so that it will be soft and easy to shape. Reaching around behind her head, Runon undid the cord that held back her hair, then gathered up her hair again and retied the cord. <laughs> Why? Just, Why you do this? Just readjusting her her hair. I just like how he's like, undid her hair to put her hair back up again, you know? Yeah, it felt like I didn't like any of that. <laughs> In the meantime, let us talk about your sword. How do you fight? With one hand or two? Aragon thought for a minute, then said, It varies. If I have a choice, I prefer to wield a sword with one hand and carry a shield with my other. However... Circumstances have not always been favorable to me, and I have often had to fight without a shield. Then I like being able to grip the hilt with both hands so I can deliver a more powerful stroke. The pommel on Zarok was large enough to grasp with my left hand if I had to, but the ridges around the ruby were uncomfortable, and they did not afford me a secure hold. It would be nice to have a slightly longer hilt. I take it you do not want a true two-handed sword, said Runon. Aragon shook his head. No, it would be too big for fighting indoors. That depends upon the size of the hilt and the blade combined, but in general, you are correct. Would you be amenable to a hand-and-a-half sword instead? An image flashed in Aragon's mind of Murtag's original sword, and he smiled. Why not? thought Aragon. Yes, a hand-and-a-half hilt, a hand-and-a-half sword would be perfect, I think. And how long would you like the blade? No longer than Xerox. Mm. Do you want a straight blade or a curved blade? Straight. Have you any preferences to the guard? Not especially. Crossing her arms, Runon sat with her chin touching her breastbone, her eyes heavy-lidded, her lips twitched. What of the width of the blade? Remember, no matter how narrow it is, the sword shall not break. Perhaps it could be a little wider at the guard than Zarok was. Why? I think it might look better. A harsh, cracked laugh broke from Runon's throat. But how would that improve the use of the sword? Embarrassed, Aragon shifted on the bench at a loss for words. What a fool! Never ask me to alter a weapon merely in order to improve its appearance, admonished Runon. A weapon is a tool, and if it is beautiful, then it is beautiful because it is useful. A sword that could not fulfill its function would be ugly to my eyes no matter how fair its shape, not even if it were adorned with the finest jewels and the most intricate engraving. The elf woman pursed her lips, pushing them out as she thought, so a sword equally suited for the unrestrained bloodshed of a battlefield, as it is for defending yourself in the narrow tunnels under Farthendor, a sword for all occasions, of middling length, but for the hilt, which shall be longer than average. A sword for killing Galbatoric, said Aragon. Runon nodded, and as such, it must be well protected against magic. Her chin sank to her chest again. Armor has improved a great deal in the past century, so the tip will need to be narrower than I used to make them the better to pierce plate and mail, and to slip into the gaps between various pieces. Mm. From a pouch by her side, Runon withdrew a knotted piece of twine, with which she took numerous measurements of Aragon's hands and arms. Afterward, she retrieved a wrought iron poker from the forge and tossed it toward Aragon. He caught it with one hand and raised an eyebrow at the elf woman. She motioned toward him with a finger and said, Go on now, up on your feet, and let me see how you move with the sword. Walking out from under the roof of the open-walled forge, Aragon obliged her by demonstrating several of the forms Brahm had taught him. After a minute, he heard the clink of metal on stone, then Runon coughed and said, Oh, this is hopeless. She stepped in front of Aragon, holding another poker. Her brow furrowed with a fierce scowl as she raised the poker before her in a salute and shouted, Have at you, Shade Slayer. Damn. Because <clears throat> he's probably like, Hmm. You just huh. like fucking... Huh. 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 <laughs> you know, like doing forms. Huh. Like, huh, aya! <laughs> so she's probably like, oh my god. And then she's just going to attack him and figure out how he actually fights. I love her character so much. Runon's heavy poker whistled through the air as she 
As she swung at him with a strong, slashing blow, dancing to the side, Aragon parried the attack. The poker jumped in his hand as the two rods of metal collided. For a brief while, he and Ruinon sparred. Although it was obvious she had not practiced her swordsmanship for some time, Aragon still found her a formidable p opponent. At last, they were forced to stop because the soft iron of the pokers had bent until the rods were as crooked as the branches of a yew tree. Runon collected Aragon's poker, then carried the two mangled pieces of metal over to a pile of broken tools. When she returned, the elf woman lifted her chin and said, Now I know exactly what shape your sword should have. But how will you make it? A twinkle of amusement appeared in Runon's eyes. I won't. You shall make the sword instead of me, Shade Slayer. Aragon gaped at her for a moment. <laughs> then sputtered and said, Me? But I was never apprenticed to a blacksmith or a bladesmith. I have not the skill to forge even a common brush knife. The twinkle in Runon's eyes brightened. Nevertheless, you shall be the one to make this sword. But how? Will you stand beside me and give me orders as I hammer the metal? Hardly, said Runon. <laughs> no, I shall guide your actions from within your mind so that your hands may do what mine cannot. It is not a perfect solution, but I can think of no other means of evading my oath that will also allow me to apply my craft. Aragon frowned. If you move my hands for me, how is that any different from making the sword yourself? Runon's expression darkened, and in a brisk voice, she said, Do you want this sword or not, Shade Slayer? <laughs> Damn. I do. Then refrain from pestering me with such questions. Making the sword through you is different because I think it is different. If I believed otherwise, then my oath would prevent me from participate, participating in the process. So unless you wish to return to the Varden empty-handed, you would be wise to remain silent on the subject. Yes, Runon Elda. Fucking duh, Aragon. Doesn't he understand how a magic works? It's like when a judge is like expunging your sentence or something. And you're like, but wait, I technically did it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Chill. You're off. Erase the earth. <laughs> Erase the earth. <laughs> <laughs> they went to the smelter then, and Runon had Sophia pry the still warm mass of congealed bright steel from the bottom of the brick trough. Break it into fist-sized pieces, Runon directed, and withdrew to a safe distance. Lifting her front leg, Sephira stamped on the rippled beam of bright steel with all her strength. The earth shook, and the bright steel cracked in several places. Three more times, Sephira stamped, stamped upon the metal before, before Runon was satisfied with the results. The elf woman gathered up the sharp lumps of metal in her apron and carried them to a low table next to her forge. Then she sorted the metal according to its hardness, which, or so she told Aragon, was able to determine by the color and texture of the fractured metal. Some is too hard, and some is too soft, she said. And while I could remedy that if I wanted to, it would require another heating. So we will only use the pieces that are already suitable for a sword. On the edges of the sword will go a slightly harder steel. She touched a cluster of pieces that had a brilliant, sparkling grain. The better to take a keen edge. The middle of the sword shall be made of a slightly softer steel. She touched a cluster of pieces that were grayer and not so bright. The better to bend and to absorb the shock of a blow. Before the metal can be forged into shape, though, it must be worked to rid it of the remaining impurities. How is that done? asked Sephira. That you shall see momentarily. Runon went to one of the poles that was supported that supported the roof of the forge, sat with her back against it, crossed her legs and closed her eyes, her face still and composed. Are you ready, Shade Slayer? she asked. I am, said Aragon, despite the tension gathering in his belly. The first thing Aragon noticed about Runon, as her minds met, was the low chords that echoed through the dark, entangled landscape of her thoughts. The music was slow and deliberate and cast in a strange and unsettling key that scraped on his nerves. What it implied about Runon's character... Aragon was not sure, but the eerie melody caused him to reconsider the wisdom of allowing her to control his flesh. But then he thought of Sephira sitting next to the forge, watching over him, and his trepidation receded, and he lowered the last of the defenses around his consciousness. It felt to Aragon like a piece of raw wool sliding over his skin as Runon enveloped his mind with hers, insinuating herself into the most private areas of his being. He shivered at the contact and almost withdrew from it, but then, Runon's rough voice sounded within his skull, Relax, Slade, relax, Shade Slater, and all shall be well. Yes, Runon Elda, 
<laughs> then Runan began to lift his arms, shift his legs, roll his head, and otherwise experiment with the abilities of his body. Strange as it was for Aragon to feel his head and limbs move without his direction, it was stranger still when his eyes began to flick from place to place, seemingly of their own accord. That'd be weird. Little puppet. The sensation of helplessness kindled a burst of sudden panic within Aragon when Runon walked him forward and his foot struck the corner of the forge and it seemed as if he were going to fall. Aragon immediately reasserted command over his faculties and grabbed the horn of Runon's anvil to steady himself. Do not interfere, snapped Runon. If your nerve fails you at the wrong moment during the forging, you could cause yourself irreparable harm. So could you if you're not careful, Aragon retorted. Be patient, Shade Slayer. I shall have mastered this by the time it is dark. Everyone just, like, needs to calm down. Tensions are too high. I'm stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm panicking. <laughs> While they waited for the last of the light to fade from the velvet sky, Runon prepared the forge and practiced wielding various tools. Her initial clumsiness with Aragon's body soon disappeared, although once she reached for a hammer and rammed the tips of his fingers into the top of a table. The pain made Aragon's eyes water. Runon apologized and said, Your arms are longer than mine. A few minutes later, when they were about to begin, she com commented, It is fortunate you have the speed and strength of an elf shade slayer, else we would have no hope of finishing this tonight. Taking the pieces of hard and soft bright steel she had decided to use, Runon placed them into the forge. At the elf's request, Sephira heated the steel, opening her jaws only a fraction of an inch so that the blue and white flames that poured from her mouth remained focused in a narrow stream and did not spill over into the rest of the workshop. So she's like, it's like ever so delicately. The roaring pillar of fire illuminated the entire atrium with a fierce blue light and made Sephira's scales sparkle and flash with blinding brilliance. Alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> Runon and Aragon removed the bright steel from the torrent of flames with a pair of tongs once the metal began to glow cherry red. She laid it on her anvil and with a series of quick blows from a sledgehammer flattened the lumps of metal into plates. Just plates, and they That's had it, dinner. The end. <laughs> <laughs> no more than a quarter of an inch thick. The surface of the red hot steel glittered with incandescent motes. As she finished with each plate, Runon dropped it into a nearby trough of brine. Brine? Mm, hmm. Salty. Having flattened all the bright steel, Runon pulled the plates out of the trough, the brine warm against Aragon's arm, and scoured each plate with a piece of sandstone to remove the black scales that had formed on the surface of the metal. The scouring exposed the crystalline structure of the metal, which Runon examined with great attentiveness. She further sorted the metal by relative hardness and purity according to the qualities of the crystals displayed. Aragon was privy to Runon's every thought and feeling by reason of their closeness. The depth of her knowledge amazed him. She th saw things within the metal he had not suspected existed, and the calculations she made concerning its treatment were beyond his understanding. He also sensed she was dissatisfied with how she had handled the sledgehammer while flattening the steel. Runon's dissatisfaction continued to grow until she said, Bah! Look at these dents in the metal. I cannot forge a blade like this. My control over your arms and hands is not fine enough to craft a sword worthy of note. Before Aragon could attempt to reason with her, Sephira said, The tools do not the artist make, Runon Elda. Surely you can find a way to compensate for this inconvenience. Inconvenience? snorted Runon. I have no more coordination than a fledgling. I'm a stranger in a stranger's house. Still grumbling, she subsided into mental deliberations that were incomprehensible to Aragon, then said, Well, I may have a solution, but I warn you, I shall not continue if I'm unable to maintain my usual level of craftsmanship. She did not explain the solution to either Aragon or Sephira, but one by one placed the plates of steel on the anvil and cracked them into flakes no wider than rose petals. Gathering up Half the flakes of the harder bright steel, Runon stacked them into a brick, which then she coated with clay and birch bark to hold them together. The brick went on a thick steel paddle with a seven-foot-long handle, similar to those used by bakers to insert and remove loaves of bread from a hot oven. Runon laid the end of the paddle in the center of the forge and then backed Aragon as far away as she could and still have him hold onto the handle. Then she asked Sephira to resume breathing fire, and again the atrium glowed with a flickering blue radiance. 
The heat was so intense, Aragon felt as if his exposed skin were crisping, and he saw that the granite stones of which the forge was made had acquired a bright yellow glow. His skin was crisping. Crispy bacon. Crispy bacon. <laughs> <laughs> the bright steel could easily have taken over half an hour to reach the appropriate temperature in a charcoal fire, but required only a few minutes in the withering inferno of Saphira's flames before it turned white. The moment it did, Runon ordered Saphira to cease breathing fire. Darkness engulfed the forge as Saphira closed her jaws. Rushing Aragon forward, Runon had him transport the glowing brick of clay-covered steel to the anvil, where she seized a hammer and welded the disparate and welded the disparate flakes of bright steel into a cohesive hole. She continued to pound on the metal, elongating it out into a bar, then made a cut in the middle, folded the metal back on itself, and welded, it to, welded the two pieces together. The bell, like peals of ringing metal, echoed off the ancient trees that surrounded the atrium. Runon had Aragon return the bright steel to the forge once its color had faded from white to yellow, and again Saphira bathed the metal with the fire from her belly. Six times Runon heated and folded the bright steel, and each time the metal became smoother and more flexible until it could bend without tearing. That's wild. That's nuts. Is this pretty accurate, like, to how you make a sword? Oh, yeah. He did an ass load of research on Japanese sword making. Is that real? Or are you memeing on me right now? Both. <laughs> it's both real and a meme. Because I was going to say, like... This is how, like, Japanese fold their steel, though. Because you would want... Because, like, when they were talking about, like, the hard and the soft, because you would want the hard on the outside for the blade and then the soft, like... In the me middle or on the back for, like, flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. This is bonkers. Instead of just, like, a regular die-cast sword loose. that'd be very loose. Um, also, I feel like I'm, like, watching an episode of, like, how it's made. That's what this feels like. I'm loving it. But magical. It. As Aragon hammered the steel, his every action dictated by Runon, the elf woman began to sing both with his tongue and her own. Together, their voice... Their voices... Together, their voices formed a not unpleasant harmony that rose and fell with the beats of the hammer. A tingle crawled down Aragon's spine as he felt Runon channel a steady flow of energy. He's singing his sword. Into the words <clears throat> they were mouthing, and he realized that the song contained spells of making, shaping, and binding. With their voices, too, Runon sang of the metal that lay on the anvil, describing its properties, altering them in ways that exceeded Aragon's understanding, and imbuing the bright steel with a complex web of enchantments designed to give it strength and resilience beyond that of any ordinary metal. Of Aragon's hammer arm, Runon also sang, and under the gentle influence of her crooning, every blow she struck with his arm landed upon its intended target. Runon quenched the bar of bright steel after the sixth and final fold was complete. She repeated the entire process with the other half of the hard bright steel, forging an identical bar to the first. Then she gathered up the fragments of the softer steel, which she folded and welded ten times before forming it into a short, heavy wedge. Wow. There's a lot of just, like, information there also is this how you like sing something into existence i mean this is how you sing smithing stuff it's when, a similar thing because like when aria sang the bow from the tree or whatever oh my god i need to stretch my little leg out <laughs> Ew, don't do that because when what aria sang from the bow yeah, sing the bow. I don't know. I wonder if it's like a, as you're like singing the proper like properties from the tree, then you like also carve, and then with carving, you're also singing while carving. I could see that. Because I doubt you just like sing it from the tree, and the tree just and like. Just like ah. Yeah. That's but you I sing like the proper properties from the tree or something. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. Singing's pretty cool. <clears throat> Next, Runon had Saphira reheat the two bars of harder steel. Runon lay the shining rod side by side on her anvil, grasped both of both <laughs> grasped both of them at either end, 
with a pair of tongs and then twisted the rods around each other several times. Seven times. Sparks shot into the air as she hammered upon the twist to weld them into a single piece of metal. The resulting mass of bright steel Runon folded, welded, and pounded back out to length another six times. When she was pleased with the quality of the metal, Runon flattened the bright steel into a thick rectangular sheet, cut the sheet in half length lengthways with a hard lengthwise with a sharp chisel, and bent each of the two halves down their middle so they were in the shape of long, shallow V's. That thing that she did where she twisted the rods around each other several times, that's how you make, like, Damascus steel. So there's, like, so many different, like, things that's going on here with, like, smithing mm -hmm. that Christopher Paolini put in because it's the way that Japanese fold their steel for their katanas, and then it's, like, the way that Damascus steel is made by twisting cords of metal together with, like, traditional, like, w just swordsmithing, creating an edge and a centerpiece. It's pretty bizarre. That's a lot. Those kitchen knives from Japan are Damascus steel. Yeah. I know that information. <laughs> And all that, Aragon estimated, Runon was able to accomplish within the, within the course of an hour and a half. Whoa! He marveled at her speed, even though it was his own body that carried out the tasks. Never, be never before had he seen a smith shape metal with such ease. What would have taken Horst hours took her only minutes. And yet no matter how demanding the forging was, Runon continued to sing, weaving a fabric of spells within the bright steel and guiding Aragon's arm with infallible accuracy. Amid the frenzy of noise, fire, sparks, and exertion, Aragon thought he glimpsed, as Runon raked his eyes across a forge, a trio of slender figures standing by the edge of the atrium. Sephira confirmed his suspicion a moment later when she said, Aragon, we are not alone. Who are they? He asked. Whoa. You, like, asked the same question he did, wow, pretty much. we're the same. <laughs> Demigon. Sephira sent him an image of the short, wizened meerkat. Where cat? Meerkat? Mermaid? Meerkat? Yeah, like a mermaid cat. Oh, I was thinking like a meerkat, like Timon. Oh. That'd be a mercat. Wow, I'm all fucked up today. <laughs> <clears throat> wizened were cat. Maud, in human form, standing between two pale elves who were no taller than she. One of the elves was male the other female, and they were both extraordinarily beautiful, even by the standards of elves. Their solemn, teardrop faces seemed wise and innocent in equal measure, which made it impossible for Aragon to judge their age. Their skin displayed a faint, silvery sheen, as if the two elves were so filled with energy it was seeping out of their very flesh. Aragon queried Runon as to the identity of the elves when she paused to allow his body a brief rest. Runon glanced at them, affording him a slightly better view. Then, without interrupting her song, she said with her thoughts, They are Alana and Dusan, the only elf children in Elismira. There was much rejoicing when they were conceived twelve years ago. They are like no other elves I have met, he said. Our children are special, Shadeslayer. They are blessed with certain gifts. Gifts of grace. Gifts, gifts of power. Did I say gifts of grace? A little <clears> bit, yeah. Gifts of grace and gifts of power, which no grown elf can hope to match. As we age, our blossom withers somewhat, although the magic of our early years never completely abandons us. Runon wasted no time talking. She had Aragon place the wedge of bright steel between the two V-shaped strips and hammer on them until the strips nearly enveloped the wedge, and friction held the three pieces together. Then, Runon welded the pieces into a hole and while the metal was still hot, she began to draw it out and form a rough blank of the sword. The soft wedge became the spine of the blade, while the other two harder strips became the sides, edges, and point. Once the blank was nearly as long as the finished sword, the sword slowed, or the work slowed as Runon returned to the tang and carefully hammered her way up the handle, establish establishing the final angles and proportions. Runon had Sephira heat the blade in segments of no more than six or seven inches at a time, which Runon arranged by holding the blade over one of Sephira's nostrils, through which Sephira would release a single jet of fire. <laughs> I just imagine like a 
It's not rocket. No. Oh. <laughs> like a um, a welder, like a little welding flame, but just mm-hmm. coming out of Safira's nostril. So she's like. <laughs> Let loose any boogers? I don't think so. A host of writhing shadows fled toward the perimeter of the atrium. Every time the fire sprang into existence, Aragon watched with amazement as his hands transformed the crude lump of metal into an elegant instrument of war. With every blow, the outline of the ba- blah, 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 the outline of the blade became clearer, as if the bright steel wanted to be a sword and was eager to assume the shape Runon desired. Probably because all that fucking singing. Magic singing. At last, the forging came to a close, and there on the anvil lay a long, black blade, which, although it was still rough and incomplete, already ra- radiated a sense of deadly purpose. Ooh. Say it again. Deadly purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Runon allowed Aragon's tired arms to rest while the blade cooled by air. Then she had Aragon take the blade to another corner of her workshop where she had arranged six different grinding wheels, and on a small bench, a wide assortment of files, scrapers, and abrasive stones. She fixed a blade between two blocks of wood and spent the next hour planing the sides of the sword with a draw knife, as well as refining the contours of the blade with files. As with the hammering, every stroke of the draw knife and every scrape of a file seemed to have twice the effect it normally would. It was as if the tools knew exactly how much steel to remove and would remove no more. When she was done filing, Runon built a charcoal, file, charcoal fire in her forge, and while she waited for the fire to mature, she mixed a slurry of dark, fine grained clay, ash, powdered pum- pumice, and crystallized juniper sap. Hmm. She painted the blade with a concoction, slathering twice as much on the spine as she did along the edges, and by the point, the thicker the solution of clay, the slower the underlying metal would cool when it was quenched, and as a result, the softer that area of the sword would become. The clay lightened as Runon dried it with a quick incantation. At the direction of the elf woman, Aragon went to the forge. He laid the sword flat upon the bed of scintillating coals, and pumping the bellows with his free hand, slowly pulled it toward his hip. Once the tip of the blade came free of the fire, Runon turned it over and repeated the sequence. She continued to draw the blade through the coals until both edges had acquired an even orange tone and the spine of the sword was bright red in color. Then, with a single smooth motion, Runon lifted the sword from the coals, swept the glowing bar of steel through the air and plunged it into the trough of water next to the forge. An explosive cloud of steam erupted from the surface of the water, which hissed and sizzled and bubbled around the blade. After a minute, the roiling water subsided, and Runon withdrew the now pearl-gray sword. Returning it to the fire, she brought the whole sword to the same low heat so as to reduce the brittleness of the edges, and then quenched it once more. Aragon had expected Runon to relinquish her hold on his body after they had forged, hardened, and tempered the blade, but to his surprise, she remained in his mind and continued to control his limbs. Oh, God. I am Aragon now. (laughs) wanted to be a dragon rider. (laughs) Runon had him douse the forge. Then she walked Aragon back to the bench with the files and scrapers and abrasive stones. There she sat him, and making use of ever finer stones, she polished the blade. From her memories, Aragon learned that she uh, she would normally spend a week or more polishing a blade, but because of the song they sang, she, through him, was able to complete the task in a mere four hours in addition to carving a narrow groove down the middle of each side of the blade. As the bright steel grew smoother, the true beauty of the metal was revealed within it. Aragon could see a shimmering, cable-like pattern, every line of which marked a transition between two layers of the velvety steel. And along each edge of the sword was a rippling, silvery-white band as wide as his thumb, which made it appear as if the edges burned with tongues of frozen fire. The muscles in Aragon's arm gave way as Runon was covering the tang with a decorative cross-hatching, and the file he was holding slipped off the tang and fell from his fingers. The extent of his exhaustion surprised him, for he had been concentrating upon the sword to the exclusion of all else. Enough, said Runon, and she removed herself from Aragon's mind without further ado. Shocked by her sudden absence, Aragon swayed on his seat 
and nearly lost his balance before he regained control over his rebellious limbs. <laughs> but we're not finished, he protested, turning toward Runon. The night sounded unnaturally quiet to him without the strains of their extended duet. Runon rose from where she had been sitting cross-legged against the pole and shook her head. I have no more need of you, Shade Slayer. Oh, God. <laughs> Go and dream until dawn. But you are tired, and even with my magic, you are liable to ruin the sword if you continue to work on it. Now that the blade is done, I can attend to the rest without interference from my oath. So go. You will find a bed on the second floor of my house. If you are hungry, there is food in the pantry. Aragon hesitated, reluctant to leave, and then nodded and shambled away from the bench, his feet dragging in the dirt. As he passed her, he ran a hand over Safira's wing and bade her good night, too wary to say more. In return, she tousled his hair with a warm puff of air and said, <laughs> I shall watch and remember for you, little one. Aragon paused on the threshold of Runon's house and looked across the shadowy atrium to where Maud and the two elf children were still standing. He raised a hand in greeting, and Maud smiled at him, baring her sharp, pointed teeth. A tingle crawled down Aragon's neck as if the elf ch as the elf children gazed at him. Their large, slanted eyes were slightly luminous in the gloom. When they made no other motion, he ducked his head and hurried inside, eager to lie down upon a soft mattress. Is his sword going to be blue <clears throat> or gray? What do you think? Blue? Or gray? <laughs> gray. <laughs> I don't know, Demi. What was every other writer's sword color? The color of their <laughs> dragon! So why would his sword be gray? I don't know, because they're hurrying. And they don't... She doesn't usually hurry things. Maybe she doesn't have time to make it blue. I don't know. Or maybe it gets made blue during the forging. And they missed it. I don't know, So man. he's just going to have this weird gray sword. Like, weird sword just like everyone else. I don't know why in my head I was thinking that like, like clay gray like yeah like just like this horrible ugly like muted <laughs> like blob matte a, gray color the borderline <laughs> like a place holder holder for like a real sword but swords are just gray, gray. <laughs> hey. Hey. I'm really excited for his sword and also, why are those children so fucking weird? <clears throat> they remind me of um, Legend of Korra, the oh chieftain's my God. Yeah. children. They just like, kind of stand and look Eska around. Eska and Desna. Eska and Deska. <laughs> no, I think it's Desna <laughs> and Eska. Okay. I'm pretty sure. This is making a stupid joke. Yeah, I'm, sh I'm not questioning your avatar knowledge. That's for sure. That's right, you're not. <laughs> Um, that was just like, they, that was just all sword making. That was just an episode of how it's made. Dur in, on this episode of Brisinger, it's a how it's made. Magical sword forging. I'm just imagining like the how it's made intro and how they always have like how it's made and then like show like a taffy or like whatever mm -hmm. how it's made elf swords and that like or whatever you know yep. the like their intro is just like i can hear it in my head but i don't think i can like you know vociferate it yeah so we ended the chapter with aragon passing out <laughs> hey, pretty, cool. pretty much. <laughs> um, From exhaustion, though. Well, I mean, he's passed out from all kinds of things. Just add it to the list. Making this magic sword. Um, Check. I just need to know now. Is the sword going to be blue? It better fucking be blue. That's your concern? Yeah. Not like... Is there going to be any difference with it, with having Runon having welded it through Aragon? Like, maybe, is it going to be weaker? Maybe a little. 
weaker? Mm. Is it going to be better? Mm. Is it going to be different at all? I feel like it'll probably be different. It'll maybe be like wonky a little. Mm. A little crooked. A little, yeah. A little crooked sword. Yeah. Maybe it'll give him an advantage. It's got a little crookedness in it, so he's able to, like, do a little swing swang with it. Defeat his enemies better. Or maybe it'll be, like, a true extension because he made it. Ooh, that's So cool. it'll feel, like, better in his arm because it'll be, like, imbued with his magic. Because he was also singing to it as well. Mm-hmm. Not just Runon. I don't know. I feel like I just want to like know the outcome now. They said in this chapter, here's the thing you want to know about. Maybe Here later. it is. And now he finally is getting a sword. I like Like a writer's out. sword. You know? <clears throat> what is this? Lint. Mm. The workaround Runon created. And how she said, it's different because I think it's different, Aragon. So shut your hard little mouth. <laughs> <laughs> But, like, he knows that, though, about magic. He's still got a human brain. He's got an elf body, but a human brain. Like, sometimes I just wonder, like, why he says the things that he says. Like, why are you the way you are? (laughs) (laughs) It's it's Aragon. He's explicitly (laughs) said before, like, that that's how magic works. Not that it's, like, out of character for him, but it might have just been something that Christopher Paolini wanted to throw in there to express the difference of... Oh, maybe. ...being bound in oaths if you think it's different type of thing. Maybe, like, a hint, hint, nudge, nudge to another character that's bound by oaths. (laughs) (laughs) You get excited for that? (laughs) Nobody could hear that, I guarantee (laughs) <laughs> Just say it normal. No. Let's go. Murtag. No. Why? It's better if it's whispered. No. He's my favorite character. I know. Kind of jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Low key jealous over here. Oh my god. I'm so excited. When's Murtag coming back? When's he gonna be a good guy? Because we know he's gonna be a good guy. Like, where is he? That's what I want. Probably to being tortured by Galbatorix. Someone help him. And no one's going to help him. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, just a joke stealer? Yeah. That's all, all you I do, do is just <laughs> say my jokes a little where, louder. Yeah, a little louder to other people. So I just look like an idiot. <laughs> I'm just going to not say anything to you and save all of my good stuff for YouTube. And then you'll laugh, but everybody else will laugh and they'll know that I'm the funny one. Oh, my God. And then people will know the truth about me. that I'm not funny. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, what? I don't know. I'm just excited. I really do like how Christopher Paolini took like so many different forms of swordsmithing and mixed them all together, but made it work to like a few different ways, made it work because it's fucking magic and you can just sing that shit together and it works, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then that. also explaining a way like, like, oh, well, if you're making Damascus steel, like you couldn't do the traditional Japanese method, like, mm-hmm. like explaining that away with saying like, well, Runon has things that's un- uncomprehensible. Like you cannot comprehend her understanding of the metal and knowledge. And she sang it together with fucking magic. So that's how it works. It would be interesting to hear from a swordsmith if that any of that's like possible. I understand magic and like blah, 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 explaining it away. But like without that aspect, if that form of swordsmithing would be possible. Maybe, probably. Or, like, what that outcome would be like if it's possible. I mean, I feel like she didn't do anything, like, crazy. I feel like it's def- it would be definitely, like, time-consuming. I would just want to know, like, what the, like, real-life outcome of that sword would be like. Actually, they did do um, a forge of Brisinger. They did make Brisinger, and I wonder how close they kept it to the book. Now that we read the book, we should watch that YouTube episode, Men at Arms. Mm-hmm. They did a forging episode oh, of Brisinger. Yeah. I was trying to remember who they like, what they were called. 
So I, I wonder if they like did the Damascus steel spine and like all that jazz, if they try to keep it as close to the book as possible or like what their input is on it, what they say. Are there? Because the one dude that makes swords, he like specializes in Japanese folded steel. And then mm. also he makes like all the other types of sword, spine, body, edges, whatever. Like he does it all. So. Um, so in this book. Oh yeah, Robert sent that to us. A while ago. And in Avatar The Last Airbender, mm -hmm. they make swords. Out of meteors. Out of meteors. Do, is that a real thing? I think so. I think they make his sword out of meteor, maybe. I don't know. We'll have to watch the episode and find out. Everybody watch that episode. Link in the bio. I want to know about meteor swords I'll make now. a comment on it. Look it. There it is. Okay, so everybody in the Discord, we got it. But for YouTube, I'll leave a link as a comment and I'll pin that comment so we can all watch that and come back in the next episode and talk about it. I'm excited. But we should wait. We should actually wait until after the next chapter to watch that episode. Because there's some things that gets talked about in the next chapter, things that happens that mm -hmm. they talk about, kind of like spoiler. Uh oh. Staying Spoiler free is hard. Yeah. It's like hard out here. Well, that'll give everybody like a couple episodes in to watch it Fuck. before we talk about it. Remind us, people in the Discord, everybody help. Help us rem <laughs> remind <laughs> us because we will just forget about it and it'll just be a thing we said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We're those people. <clears throat> Any last input? You love Rune on? Mm hmm. As far as like favorite characters, probably Murtag, Runon, Roran. Murtag, Roran, Runon. Yep, that's the order. Because we don't really like know her, know her, but I really appreciate her dedication and passion for her craft. I also like how she says, like, a sword that is useful is beautiful because it's useful, and that'd be like the most beautiful sword versus something that's like elegant. Mm -hmm. If it's useless, then it's trash. I'm like, a woman after my own heart. I can live by that. I just love that she's like, like there is like a right way to do this and it's the only way to do this, you know? And it's like, who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you to argue with her? She's like older than the fucking writers. She's so old. That's wild. And she just does everything by hand too, even though she could do it by magic and her doing this by magic was like, I imagine kind of like painful in a way for her because it's like, she's not, it's not like pure. You know what I mean? It's not the way that she usually does it. But do mm -hmm. you think that the sword would be better then because of its magic being magically imbued? No, I think it'll probably end up with like the same outcome. Like it might be a little bit different or have like a different like property than her swords usually have, but I don't think that it'll, it'll probably be like Minecraft. Like, if you have a diamond sword, it's still a diamond sword, and it still does this much damage. But if you enchant it, like, it's still a dam it's still a diamond sword, and it still does that. But now you can just, like, fish better or something. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, you know what to do. Stay tuned. I think by now, by this episode coming out, we should have been streaming on Twitch. So stay tuned for that. Hit us up. We're streaming The Last of Us. It's been decided by you guys. Somebody had commented and said, like, stream whatever you guys want. I want to see, like, what you guys want to stream. And I'm like, dude, I want to stream Last of Us. I was, like, low-key hoping everyone voted for Last of Us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great game. Okay, I'm not disagreeing. And then playing it together will be so much fun. Maybe I'll pass the controller over to you. I... Mm, it's a zombie game. Yeah, we got to get all dark and creepy in I'm here. I'm like already sweating. Hell yeah. And then the last of, last of Us 2 is coming out. So that's going to be like on the back burner. That's going to be the follow-up to this game. But if we have time somehow in between the two games coming out, then we'll probably play something else. We'll probably just play something like to fart around. We did get the Nintendo 64 hooked up so we could play some Mario Kart. We need to get Mario Kart. We don't have and it. And Mario Party. And Mario Party. 
Well, thanks everyone. You can follow the Twitch at twitch.tv slash dead inside. Pretty simple. Easy peasy. Just like the channel. Lemon squeezy. And we'll see you in the next one. Well, when do you want to start? Whenever. The Twitch. I don't know. You want to do it this evening? Yeah, we You want to do it in the evening times or during the day times? Sure, I just need you to give me a decision. <clears throat> Should we make a schedule? Yes. Let's not stream today. Okay. But let's make a schedule for tomorrow. Okay. I just need...